Okay, do you have question or something we could discuss? I'm going to get water while you think. intervention in terms of environment and I was wondering um, when you're talking about environmental mobilization uh, it is so it is the objective to also have more states taking care of environmental issues or is so the mobilization serves to force the state to act there or should the mobilization itself uh, act on environmental issues that's a very good question and there is no one answer to it. I mean, I was working with, you know, there was a mobilization of uh, gypsies, uh, Rome, as we yeah. say in French, uh, in the south of uh, the metropolis of Paris. And they very much live upon the waste recycling. And when ecology came into the political local game, they say we're specialists of the waste recycling, so you, we should be part of the city uh, policy making. So the city takes them to their word and gives them space and gives them recognition. And so now, want, nowadays they want to be, become a public service. This is very absurd. I mean, it's against what we think of this kind of local mobilization. So I would say some of them want to become part of this local policy making, even part of the state for some, but others think it's better to stay on the fringe or, or to stay in opposition. I mean, there is no one answer. Uh, once again, there are a, a big plurality of this mobilization, which makes them interesting. I mean, depending of who, when, with whom, I would say, and where, yeah. Sure, I mean, uh, well, for example, in New York City, they received funds from, uh, I'm talking about the one I know, from the Bloomberg Foundation, which was one, uh, who was once a mayor of, uh, of, uh, of New York, but who is also a millionaire, and he's paying them to contribute to the environmental state of the city. Uh, but it's also, for example, the mobilization around Central Park are receiving money from all the neighbors of Central Park, which means that the, it is a very rich mobilization. I don't know, one or two or three millions. I must have the, uh, the slide show about that. But, uh, but if you take the local mobilization who are taking care of the Queen's uh, gardens, I mean, it's like very poor area, so they receive less money. And, uh, and in France, uh, I mean, it's much more structured. I mean, they uh, receive money and, for example, seeds or other things they need from local, uh, local actors, municipalities or even uh, uh, inter-municipalities. But it's a very small budget. It's, uh, it's not the case of Emmaus, which receive funds from everywhere. I mean, uh, once again, you have to look at the plurality. It's like a feuille. I don't even know how you say feuille in French, uh, in English. But uh, it's like, oof, you have to look at all the layers and how they do interconnect. Uh, and at the time, the first time I analyzed that in the suburbs of Paris, in the poor suburbs of Paris, you found that collective mobilization about cultural issues were 
interconnected at the national scales much more easily their environmental mobilization. At the time, local mo uh, environmental mobilization were much more localized than cultural mobilization. But it's not the case anymore. Uh, you find they have grown and they know best, better to organize themselves uh, uh, through networking at different scales. Uh, so it depends. Uh, it depends very much of uh, the cause also, obviously. Uh, yeah? a logic that is maybe against the capitalist logic or different than the capitalistic logic. Um, and often these organizations would benefit from creating alliances and networks of solidarity between them, even if they don't work on specifically the same issues. I wonder, if, since there are a lot of organizations and mobilizations that are not, not politicized, like you said, and often sometimes see their action as really local and really targeted. I wonder what, uh, what opportunities you see to maybe foster the collaboration in this context. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the, uh, in, the in the nine, uh, 2015, I thought of creating this map you have seen b before uh, it was done. And at the time, I was uh, torn between the fact that this kind of maps could be used as a political tool in both ways. I mean, you make this mobilization visible, as you can see, but you can also give them a to, to be a tool for interconnecting and just uh, growing. And in fact, it was the second uh, option that most mobilization choose, they choose the cartographic uh, ways of uh, building up. It's interesting how they used, it's why I, uh, in introduction I told you of the importance of geography of, uh, and that's true that uh, you can find doing field work that these maps are making visible some way to structure or interstructure in between mobilization. It's new way. I don't know how long it will last. Maybe it will uh, uh, be seen as too dangerous in the future. I don't know. Uh, but right now it is a tool to grow. That's, uh, that's sure. Other tools to grow are specific action. Uh, for example, you find um, les PTC, Pôle Territoriaux de Coopération Économique, uh, Territorial Pôle of Economic Cooperation. They are initiated by local mobilization, but this local mobilization can talk to local uh, stakeholders or mayors or cities and make them come in the network and tell them, well, you know, that's us who are creating the network, that's not you, uh, that's not the city, that's not the usual political actors, and now they're entitled to do that. So you find a growing, uh, you find more tools uh, than before for this mobilization to create political action at the territorial scale. And that's interesting because, uh, for example, uh, when you look at space, you see the city of Paris. This is a mayor of Paris, so you see a space. But in reality, if you talk about mobilization, you can find a link between the space that was created in the 13th neighborhood with the south suburbs. And it is a whole network of mobilization. And it is a new space of, uh, of loot, of fight uh, that has been created. So, you can see that the way we see space uh, can be transformed through these new fights also. I mean, that's what's interesting. These maps show new spaces somehow, and not the spaces of the state. Obviously, they are counter-states.
Yeah. Um, outside the United States and Europe, yeah. do you think uh, that this story of the uh, envir uh, environmental movements and also especially for the ordinary environmentalism, do you think they follow a similar path in other countries in Africa, Asia or America? And uh, adding to this, uh, is there a network of regional um, organizations, for example, the CATS organizations, for example, do, is it common to have this small organization to have contacts, for example, with other CATS organizations in other cities, or they are, these networks mostly uh, attached to like big movements that are transnational, like the uh, WF and stuff? Yeah. No, I've uh, been invited, uh, it was uh, before shipping, uh, transformed himself in such an authoritarian. It was during, uh, what was his name, the previous uh, head of government in China. Uh, I can't remember, whatever. It's oh, okay. I can't remember because I was invited to see how we could look at this local organization in China. And there is a strong tradition in China, for example, of this local mobilization. Uh, because it is seen in the Confucian tradition as a way to organize uh, family, domestic neighborhood. It's also a cultural, uh, it's not only against, it's also very much ingrained in our cultures, you see. And another part of the network was in Kenya. And you find such works regarding such organization in South Africa, because I know of colleagues working there. So you can find, once again, you have to look at local context, but you can find the same kind of pattern everywhere. If you look at uh, urban agriculture, you can find really from Russia, Tatarstan to Brazil, you can find uh, such uh, mobilization and which stay very much under the radar, but uh, which are nonetheless very important in, uh, in local lives. In, uh, so, and what was the other part of the question? Uh, the network between uh, yeah. and Depending on the topic. Okay. I would say, I mean, if you, for example, <laughs> I mean, this is, uh, you can find that a ridiculous example, this example of free cats, but they were organized through all over the world. I mean, it's like, you know, free cats. Okay, but I don't know why these people are from very, very uh, uh, low class were very much organizing this. I don't know why, I mean, I don't. But on some topics, yes, on some topics, no. And on urban agriculture, I would think so, yes, uh, they're, they're quite organized. So, but uh, it, it could be interesting to have, uh, to look at that, why they're organized on one topic and why not on the other, uh, and why in one country not, I mean, there are all kind of uh, reasons to explain that, yes? You French? Yes. Ah, that's why you understand my French. <laughs> <laughs> I saw you. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, just because a tool uh, not that famous, which is called the uh, Open Street Map. Oh yeah. Sure. Where you have the, the, world, the world map, and it's made by communities, and so it's in the language of the, the country. This is basically done by the people in the country. But if you want to avoid uh, Google Maps, then it's, uh, it's, it's too. Do you know OpenStreetMap? Yes, some of you, but not all of you. It's true, it's, uh, there are many tools. Uh, th th I was uh, engaged uh, for one moment f with the mobilization for low tech, uh, low technology. Uh, and I went to this uh, summit, so-called, so in Toulouse. And uh, they were very much engaged with producing this kind of tools, like OpenStreetMap and Framapad and all these, uh, you know, software tools. Uh, and I found there were uh, just 99% of men. So I thought that uh, there was still some way to engage better with these issues. So it's like, uh, 
And the same for l'atelier paysan. Do you know l'atelier paysan? It's a local mobilization helping uh, farmers to, to, to get more low technology uh, in some areas of France. I mean, they're all over France, but more engaged in some places than others. Uh, yes? I wanted to ask you, what was your most enjoyable or successful uh, mobilization that you were a part of? Uh, there are touching moments. I would say when I was in Russia, for example, that was uh, in 2013, I was uh, in very, very poor areas. I mean, uh, that was in the suburbs of Dver. Dver is in between Moscow, Moscow and, and uh, St. Petersburg. Uh, like to, it's just, uh, it was like, I don't have pictures here, I don't think, but uh, you can see what we called the hot French building. It's called like that in there, you know, this big building. I mean, what you see in France is nothing compared to what's there. I mean, it's like huge collective building, but huge in fields with nothing around. I mean, just nothing around, just fields, mud and snow. It's like, uh, and this uh, group of people, because after the perestroika, uh, they felt abandoned by the state, you know, and so they had to regroup to, you know, just to take care of the place. I mean, uh, and so one touching moment was when they say, we, we, uh, we have a right to beauty like people of the center. And this was very touching for me because when you talk of poor people or people deprived of everything, you always think they need only the necessary, meaning drink, food, and they just talked of beauty. And that was a very learning moment for me to understand that all of us need something which has to do with uh, the dignity of living in, in a place. Uh, let, I mean, it's not uh, a way to say it, but uh, that's something uh, because when now people do tell me, yes, well, it's nice, you environmental mobilization, but people just need to drink, uh, feed themselves and such. Uh, I, I mean, this is not a description of what we need to leave. Uh, I don't think so right now. So, and uh, what, there were plenty of moments, I would say. Uh, but you have to see pictures of these places in Russia. I mean, it was like, ooh. So, <laughs> are there other questions? Oh, yeah, sorry. Also, in some social movements, I was wondering if you like, are currently engaged in like some movements in in the France. You also can talk a little bit about the local fights that are happening right now here. So I am engaged in. Uh, I was so I was engaged in the solidarity movement, uh, solidarity cooperative. Uh, in the 13th neighborhood, uh, which was, uh, you know, it, uh, food of quality, but also the idea was to build up social security of food, uh, meaning that we could articulate and we could articulate different uh, groups in order to distribute a food of quality to different kind of people that some people would contribute more than others and others would receive more than uh, the first. So this is still a growing issue, which is not easy uh, for many reasons because the actual crises tend to, to reduce the opportunity of such a movement. Uh, the reality of it is quite harsh and uh, the budget, for example, for environmental issues, even for solidarity movements, uh, are just uh, disappearing uh, at all levels. So it means that more and more people need to give more and more free times and, you know, engage more in this issue to be able to do something. 
that's uh, quite a difficult issue. Um, and I am engaged also in the Boost Citoyen. Maybe you know that, the Boost, Eco Boost Citoyen. It's with uh, Alternatiba, Ville en Transition, uh, Blanc Bleu Zebre, and uh, Asteria. I am part of uh, the Asteria. We, we, we analyzing how people do engage and uh, seeing, see, seeing how to accompany them uh, to local engagements in different collectives. Um, again, this is a difficult issue. Sometimes it's successful and sometimes, for example, uh, the collective signed up a, a, a pact with the uh, wanted to be mayor. And once this guy uh, became mayor, uh, he didn't realize what he engaged himself to do. So sometimes you, it's a difficult fight, but there are, uh, there are success. I mean, it's like right now what I am living is these two, and I find it quite harsh because uh, you need a lot of uh, uh, energy. <laughs> and sometimes it's, uh, well, but you feel better about yourself. That's already that. <laughs> so, uh, me, I mean. Are there other questions? So I, I have one thing more to tell you. Uh, OK. Uh, this is about pedagogy. Uh, because we're trying to tackle with this issue of getting out of the ivory tower of academy. And so we're creating, we, are, we are creating what we call the school territory. Uh, and I talked to you briefly about it. Uh, and some people do f feel, uh, did feel interested because I, I received a letter from whom I don't know. Maybe she's not here. I think it was. Oh, this is you. OK. So this will be in February from the 1st to the 11th. It, was, it will be in Pays Basque, uh, which means near, near, near Biarritz, uh, near en, 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 in the Pyrenees. So the idea of this school territory is that the uh, local actors do command a study to the students, a professional study of how to transition, ecologically speaking. And the students try to tackle with the local issues in order to propose a solution. This is the meaning you have, uh, uh, I mean, uh, you. Uh, Meaning, if you're part of the group, uh, this group is around like 15 people from geography, biology, sociology, even anthropology, I think, uh, students. And they're studying the territory, seeing how they can respond. They're spending 15 days there. And they're uh, making interviews of uh, collective mobilization, different actors, different players. And then they're writing this report, and, uh, and, uh, and then they can be judged harshly. I, I remember that because I was engaged in such a pedagogical action in Fontainebleau. I don't know if you know where is Fontainebleau. It's a major forest in the south of uh, Paris. And we worked with the local actors. We did this analysis of the territory. We suggested new ways of transitioning. And they say, well, it's not good because it means that you are with our enemies. Uh, because we, did, uh, we were very critical of what they were doing at the time. So it was not easy reception. So it's interesting because you learn a lot of things about reality. It's a reality check. <laughs> uh, but in the same time, uh, it's, uh, it's a very learning experience. So one thing which is necessary, if you, uh, everything is paid for. So whoever wants to come is welcome. 
uh, we have the money for that. Uh, it's better if you speak a bit of French, or more than a bit, it's even better. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you will work in, in, I will be there, you will work in interdisciplinary group, uh, meaning you will not be <coughs> only economist, uh, and you will have to participate to the writing of the report, and I discussed it with David just before coming here, and he said to tell you that if you choose to come with us, uh, the idea is to make this learning experience a topic of the final uh, uh, thesis. Yeah. So in order for you not to do double, you know, double work. So you, you have the date, you have the destination. I will be more precise if you write to me. Uh, I will be there. It's in the mountains, but it's in February. It can be a bit cold, not too much right now. Uh, it's a beautiful place. Uh, Where is the city? In the Pays Basque, in the Béarn. Je vais te dire, j'ai reçu la lettre, je te, je te dirai après. C'est, uh, yes? I didn't create it yet, but I'm going to do it. I'm, uh, I, I will do it with my colleagues uh, in order for you to get informed about it. Uh, and uh, the lodgings are not luxurious, okay? Don't uh, expect to be in an hotel. We will be all, I think, <laughs> in dorms or things like that. I mean, it's like uh, the usual for us. Il, uh, the first to the 11th of February. And I discussed it with David. You have a course until the 3rd, but it told me for the one who wanted to come, you, you, you can skip the two days necessary. So, so thank you very much. I hope that it was uh, interesting for you. And uh, you have my uh, email address, and if you want to if you final thesis on one of these topic, you welcome and I can, uh, you know, uh, I will interact. Thank you.